This is my first video update coming to you from downtown Athens, Greece. Let's talk about some news. And uh, what is the big story? A couple of interesting big stories and a really big clown world. Maybe two big clown worlds. And uh, the big story that I think we should lead off with was the meeting in Lviv with Erdogan, Erdogan, Elensky, and uh, UN Secretary General Guterres. Now, this is an interesting story because not much has really been reported with regards to what the three agreed on. And the agenda for the meeting was allegedly to talk about the grain exports from Odessa and to talk about the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant and find a solution there. But no doubt the big ticket item on the agenda was trying to find a resolution to the uh, conflict in Ukraine. Now, as far as the grain exports from Odessa, Guterres did say that uh, he's very happy with the progress. And he says that because of this, uh, this agreement, that had been brokered between Elensky, uh, Erdogan, Putin, and the United Nations. It looks like the food crisis that we were talking about a, a month ago is, uh, is now looking to, to be resolved, at least with regards to wheat and fertilizer to various regions in the world. So that was pretty much the statement from Guterres. We all know that uh, the main, the main issue with regards to the food crisis had nothing to do with Odessa and Ukraine. It actually had to do with the second document in that agreement, which was the document to quietly uh, lift sanctions on Russian grain and fertilizer. The first part of the agreement, which was the, uh, the entire exporting of grain from Odessa and that whole plan to export grain from Odessa was actually the cover to, uh, to the more important second document, which was to, to lift the ban on sanctions on Russian wheat and fertilizer, which is actually leading to the, uh, the easing of, uh, of fear for, uh, for a global food, uh, food shortage. So we all know that Gutierrez's statement with regards to, to the Odessa uh, exporting of wheat is just BS. That's just just nonsense. Um, the second thing that they were talking about was uh, the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. And here we don't have much to, to go on as far as concrete um, proposals or action plans. Uh, Elensky, for his part, he said that uh, he's he's fine with with sending uh, people UN officials to the uh, Zaporozhye power plant, as long as as long as Russia agrees to uh, to make that plant into a civilian authorized uh, territory, and that was kind of what uh, Gutierrez echoed as well. The uh, the Zaporozhye power plant, the region around it, has to be passed off into the control, into the hands of civilians. Uh, to be more precise, this is what uh, what Elensky said with regards to the Zaporozhye NPP. And he said this on his uh, Telegram channel, that Kiev doesn't see any hurdles preventing a delegation of international atomic energy agencies uh, from visiting the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, quote, there are no objective ob obstacles for an IAEA mission to reach the ZNPP, the Zaporozhye NPP. Uh, Elensky said that he discussed the details of arranging a trip by the IAEA delegation with uh, Guterres uh, during the talks in Lvov. And he said that Turkey, Turkey is ready to help to rebuild the city of Kharkov and the surrounding region. I thank Turkey for its readiness to take under its patronage the reconstruction of Kharkov and the Kharkiv region, he said in a video statement. I, I didn't really get that. I, there's not much information with regards to this Elensky 
thanking Turkey to rebuild Kharkov. That I did not get. But the basic overall plan from what I read, from a whole bunch of sources, which once again didn't really have much insight as to the, uh, the talks between the three parties with regards to the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, was that they want this to be passed to civilian hands. This has to be agreed upon between Russia and Ukraine. And once it's agreed upon, then uh, the UN and the IAEA, they can send a delegation to the uh, ZNPP. I did see some reports saying that, and I think this was from Sputnik News, saying that uh, there could be an IAEA delegation at the uh, ZNPP in the first weeks of September. I haven't seen anything else published with regards to that uh, breaking news, but that's what I saw on uh, on Sputnik. So that's what we know with regards to what was discussed for the uh, Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Now, let's talk about what I think was the real discussion the real uh, meat of this of this uh, tripartite meeting between these guys and it has to do with trying to figure out a solution to the conflict now uh, there was a private meeting that took place between Erdogan and Zelensky and uh, the statements from Zelensky in public were all in praise of uh, of Erdogan of Turkey of uh, Erdogan's um, initiative to try and broker and mediate some sort of peace agreement. Uh, Erdogan said that he believes that there will be a diplomatic solution to this conflict. Uh, Elensky said that the visit of the president of Turkey to Ukraine is a powerful message of support from such a powerful country. So you had all of these public statements saying that there's going to be a diplomatic path to a solution and Alensky was uh was kissing Erdogan's butt pretty much but um he was he was wearing his green camouflage shirt by the way he didn't bother to put on a a suit and tie he didn't decide to suit up for this meeting it looks like Alensky has become very attached to this uh to this costume that they have him wearing but uh the real meeting took place behind closed doors and here is, here is where I think Erdogan wants things to move towards. I think Erdogan definitely wants a diplomatic resolution to this conflict. I believe Erdogan does not want to see Russia moving any further west. Erdogan does not want to see Russia uh, take over Odessa. He does not want to see Russia reach Transnistria because Erdogan would prefer to see the Black Sea, control of the Black Sea, not fall into uh, Russian hands. He would not like Russia to, uh, to be the, the controller of the Black Sea uh, with regards to Ukraine, at least with regards to Ukraine's southern shoreline. And that is why Erdogan wants to see this conflict frozen ASAP. And let me read you something from theindependent.co.uk. I won't be quoting The Independent often in my uh, videos, but in this instance, I think this is a good uh, couple of paragraphs to, uh, to quote. So, oh, by the way, Turkey signed an agreement to help Ukraine rebuild the war damage estimated, estimated at 100 billion. So that's just a little more insight. I'm seeing that from uh, The Independent as well. Once again, I'm not quite sure what, uh, what they discussed with regards to rebuilding Ukraine, especially in the Kharkov region. And... Turkey signing up to uh, reconstruct these areas, but if I get some more information, I'll, I'll report it. Let me get to, to the real reason why Erdogan is so keen on, uh, on ending this conflict before Russia gets to Transnistria. More broadly, Russia's war has initiated a dramatic historic shift. Over the centuries, Ukraine helped Russia seized control of the Black Sea from Turks, who controlled the key Crimean Peninsula until the late 18th century. A partnership with Ukraine 
will counter Russian influence over the Black Sea. Quote, Turkey's policy is pro-Ukraine but not anti-Russia, said Soner Tagdape, a Turkey expert at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Turkey will do everything to make sure Ukraine is victorious while keeping ties with Russia economically, end quote. So to me, this, uh, this quote from this DC think tank um, is, pretty, is pretty much uh, where I see things with regards to what's going on with uh, this Turkish mediation. Erdogan, he'll accept, he'll find a way to work with and he'll find a way to accept Russia, Russia controlling all of Ukraine's uh, shoreline. But Erdogan would prefer from a geopolitical standpoint to not have Russia exert so much control and leverage on, uh, on and over the Black Sea. He would prefer to see Russia stop where it is and still have Ukraine controlling some of the, the Black Sea shoreline for obvious reasons. Erdogan doesn't want to see so much Russian influence and power projected in, uh, in this region and over the Black Sea. So he would prefer to see Ukraine there to act as a kind of uh, pressure point, act as some leverage. And if Turkey has excellent relations with Ukraine and if it can help rebuild Ukraine and rebuild Kharkov, as Alensky said in a statement, which I don't see it happening, but if he can do that, well then, you know, Turkey still controls, uh, still has leverage over Russia with regards to the Black Sea area. They can use Ukraine to have additional leverage over Russia with regards to the Black Sea. So that is why I believe Erdogan would like to see this conflict end right now. And that is the real reason why I think he was in Lvov. Lvov, Lviv, whatever. <laughs> you know, Dnieper, Dnieper Petrovsk. I prefer Dnipro Petrovsk. I think it's a nicer name. But anyway, um, that is my take on what, on what was uh, going on in, uh, in Lviv during this uh, tripartite meeting. The real reason to all of this, uh, to this meeting was for Erdogan to find a way to stop Russia in their tracks right now before Russia gets control of the entire shoreline. By the way, uh, Erdogan will be calling Putin to brief Putin on what was said. So that, I think, was the big story. The next story that I want to talk about has to do with the G20 meeting in Bali. This is a great story. And uh, Zero Hedge has a really great paragraph with regards to the story. We're getting confirmation now that both China's Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin will be attending the G20 in Indonesia, in Bali, in person. The title from Zero Hedge reads, Putin will attend G20 summit in Indonesia despite U.S. demands to exclude Russian leader. I can't wait for this uh, meeting to take place. Remember, Ursula, Ursula van der Krazy said if Putin dares to show up in Indonesia in person, she is going to give Putin a piece of her mind. I can't wait. Please, God, please let uh, Putin <laughs> go to uh, Bali in person. Anyway, um, here's what Zero Hedge had to say. And I think this is a really uh, good couple of paragraphs. The Western world is about to stop waging some bizarre war against Vladimir Putin that has sparked loathed energy hyperinflation across most of Europe and is about to embrace the Russian leader behind closed doors of course, even if it means a terribly vexed Alensky and U.S. deep state. Why? Because pariah Putin is about to reemerge on the G20 scene again, this time courtesy of Indonesian President Joko Widodo, today, who today said that both Putin and China's President Xi both plan to attend the G20 summit in the resort island of Bali later this year. Xi Jinping will come. President Putin has told me he will come. Chakowi, as the president is known, said in an interview with Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Miklawait on Thursday. It was the first time the leader of the world's fourth most populous nation confirmed both of them were planning to show up at the November summit, according to Bloomberg. Needless to say, the presence of Xi and Putin at the meeting will set up a showdown with the deep state handlers who control Joe Biden's teleprompter and other less senile Western leaders, all of whom 
are set to meet in person for the first time since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The attack has left the G20 divided over whether to place sanctions on Russia because while a handful of G20 countries are relatively self-reliant, most are desperate for Russia's commodity exports, whose lack has sent European energy prices to, well, just look for yourselves. <laughs> Putin and Chakowa discussed preparations for the G20 summit in Bali in a telephone call Thursday. The Kremlin said in a statement that didn't mention whether the Russian leader will attend. Putin's attendance will also bring him face to face with Zelensky for the first time since Russia's invasion. Because for some odd reason, the Ukrainian president, who also doubles as a Vogue model, is also slated to be a Bali. <laughs> Bad. Hats off to Zero Hedge. That is a great couple of paragraphs. I love it. For some reason, Zelensky's going to be at the G20 uh, meeting, even though Ukraine's economy is far, 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 far from being a G20 economy. And Zero Hedge pokes fun at Zelensky, and they call him uh, a Vogue model. He doubles as a Vogue model. Well done, Zero Hedge. And then I love the, the line about Biden, that you're going to see a, a showdown between Xi and Putin and the deep state handlers who control Joe Biden's teleprompter and other less senile uh, Western leaders. <laughs> well done, Zero Hedge. So look, um, I, I don't read this as having 100% confirmation that uh, Putin will be in Bali in person. It looks like that's where we're heading. But I, I, I'm not gathering that he's going to be there in person. It's, it's not confirmed 100%. We're seeing that Indonesia uh, has spoken with uh, with Moscow, with the Kremlin, and they're preparing everything for the event. I take it as they're preparing security detail and everything like that. But um, it, the Kremlin still hasn't given 100% confirmation. Putin will be there in person. We have had hints saying that Putin may be there um, via video. So let's not get our hopes up just yet, but boy, I can't wait. I really, really can't wait if he does show up in person to see Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin take on the uh, the Bozo G7 nations, because that's what we're talking about. <laughs> I can't wait. Man, oh man, Biden and uh, who else? And Trudeau and Schultz and all of these knuckleheads. Who's going to be representing the UK? Liz Truss? Oh, my God. Please, Kremlin, please confirm that Vladimir Putin's going to be there in person. Anyway, I think that's an interesting story. I thought that was an interesting story. And uh, well done, Zero Hedge, in your description of events. And good on Zero Hedge for being one of the few publications that actually mentions uh, one of the main reasons the collective West economies, the EU economies, are in such a tailspin and are on the brink of collapse is because of their bozo sanctions. Their boneheaded sanctions against Russia. Zero Hedge is calling them out for it. You will never hear this type of talk from the collective West when they discuss recession and an energy crisis and inflation and stuff like that. They just say, oh, uh, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they never say it wasn't because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It was the reaction of our idiot leaders who somehow thought that placing these shock and awe sanctions on Russia would make, would, would make things better when in fact they have made things uh, infinitely worse. You'll never hear a statement like that coming out of uh, Western mainstream media, but it's the truth. There's other reasons why you have hyperinflation and, and uh, EU economies and Western economies on collapse, but uh, the sanctions that they placed on Russia did not help. And that is why, going back to my main story, that is why the UN continues to provide cover for the food shortage uh, crisis that they were talking about a month ago by saying everything is now solved because ships are leaving Odessa. Give me a break, Gutierrez. Stop. Stop your lies. We all know that the main reason why the food shortage crisis seems to have been averted is because you signed that second document that no one wants to talk about, which was the collective West waving a white flag and surrendering to Russia and rolling back uh, many of the sanctions that were placed on fertilizer 
and uh, wheat and stuff like that. So with that said, how about uh, Victor Orban? How about Orban and this statement? The deadly conflict in Ukraine has the potential to demonstratively put an end to Western hegemony globally. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has claimed in an interview with German online magazine Tisches Elmblick, Enblick, published on Thursday, Orban said he expects the European Union to emerge weaker in the global arena once the fighting in Ukraine is over. The Hungarian leader argued that the West is incapable of winning the conflict militarily and that the sanctions it has imposed on Moscow have failed to destabilize Russia. To make matters worse, the punitive measures have spectacularly backfired on Europe, he said. Thank you, Orban. Quote, it is quite poss possible that it will be this war that will demonstratively put an end to Western supremacy, Orban said. So Orban is being very diplomatic in his statements. He doesn't want to say that the EU effed up. He doesn't want to say that the collective West effed up. He is uh, being very diplomatic and saying, uh, it looks like we're possibly seeing an end to Western hegemony. Orban knows what's happening. He knows that uh, when it comes to the economic war, the West is losing really, really bad. He knows when it comes to the war on the ground, uh, Ukraine and NATO is losing very, very bad. But he's using these qualifiers like possibly and demonstratively and stuff like that. But he knows the score and he's, uh, he's going on record as, as saying, you know what? I was the only leader in the European Union who told you guys the reality of the situation, who told you all how it is. And I'm telling the Hungarian people, I'm on record with the Hungarian people, to the Hungarian people, as being the only guy that saw things for, for what they were. You know, I wasn't delusional about the situation. So I thought that was an interesting statement from Orban. Since we're talking about the crazy EU, let's, uh, let's talk about the fact that in a couple of weeks, it looks like the EU will indeed pull the trigger, uh, trigger on a Russian travel ban. And it's going to happen exactly as I noted it would happen. The EU is going to allow very basic visas for Russian travelers, but they will do away with the uh, multi-entry, multi-year Schengen type of visas that uh, the EU and Russia have, agree have an agreement with. And um, the European Commu Commission came out with a statement yesterday, and they said that they favor and I quote, a coordinated approach regarding Russian visa bans. But so far, no EU member state has fully ceased issuing visas to Russian citizens. This is according to an EU spokesperson uh, during a press briefing in, Bru in Brussels. Anita Hipper said, as of now, visa activities have not stopped completely. And in particular, the humanitarian cases are catered for. She also said that Russia's offensive against Ukraine, which began in late February, had created an unprecedented, has had created unprecedented challenges, not only for what, for that Eastern European country, but also for all of the EU. How exactly did this conflict, invasion, special military operation cause unprecedented challenges for all of the EU? How exactly did this conflict in Ukraine cause these unprecedented challenges for all of the EU? I'll tell you how because the EU decided to, uh, to implement a type of shock and awe regime change plan, which failed spectacularly, that's how. And now the EU has boxed itself in and they have come, come out the very, very big loser in all of this, but they have no reverse gear. And now that they have exhausted all of the sanctions that they could possibly throw at Russia and Russia has absorbed these sanctions and is gonna come out much stronger and much better in the end. And the EU is gonna come out much weaker and much worse in the end, the only thing the European Union has left is to fall back on bigotry, discrimination, and racism, hate. That's all they have left, is to just show their hate, and that's why they're looking to uh, implement this Russian travel visa ban in a coordinated approach. Boy, those words, when I hear those words coming out of the European Union, it terrifies me, because they said the same thing with regards to that disease, where they uh, had a coordinated approach 
for the lockdowns. They said the same thing with regards to austerity and the economic crisis that the EU is facing with, uh, with the quote unquote pig nations, Portugal, Greece, Italy, Spain, Ireland. They said the same thing back then and look what happened. Whenever the EU says coordinated approach, you know that you're looking at some stupid, dumb, globalist, uh, ideolo uh, ide ideology, ideology uh, rooted plan. <laughs> when I hear coordinated approach, you know the EU is ready to really, really mess up in a big, big way. And they're going to mess up in a big, big way with this Russian travel uh, travel ban, but they have no reverse gear none whatsoever so should i get to my two clown worlds there's an interesting story that russia has moved uh mig fighters armed with hypersonic missiles to kaliningrad i thought that was an interesting story they're going to serve as an additional measure of strategic deterrence remember the story that i that i reported on a couple of days from uh from the acropolis area where i mentioned how the estonian defense minister was saying that finland and uh, sweden are going to create a NATO lake, a NATO sea, by blocking off Russia in uh, in St. Petersburg in the uh, in the Baltic. Remember that story? Well, I think you might be getting one of uh, Russia's responses to that, which is um, three MiG-31 fighters arrived in Kaliningrad with Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, and I'm sure they're going to bring a whole hell of a lot more. Uh, hypersonic missiles and MiG fighters to Kaliningrad. So I think you're starting to see Russia's response to these ridiculous statements coming out of Estonia with regards to uh, closing off Russia in the Baltic. Russia is not going to have any of that type of nonsense, believe me. That is not going to happen at all. And uh, let's get to our cloud worlds. <laughs> oh, here's another story. I got one more. I got one more. Uh, the Washington Post is about to dump on Alensky. They're running an article saying that the war is all of all Alensky's fault. They're saying that many people in Ukraine are infuriated by the admission from uh, Alensky that he made this week in an interview with the Washington Post, where he revealed that uh, he sacrificed lives for the sake of running the economy. And that is why he hid the fact that uh, Russia was planning an invasion, a special military operation, a conflict with Ukraine. And this is an interview that he gave with the Washington Post. And he said he did all of this because he didn't want to tank the Ukraine economy. That's why he hid his knowledge of the invasion. Before Alensky seemed beyond reproach a national hero to Ukrainians, the publication said, but the acknowledgement has punctured the bubble, triggering a cascade of public criticism, unprecedented since the war began. That is a quote from the Washington Post. During the interview with the American newspaper, Alensky admitted that prior to the outbreak of hostilities with Russia, he was downplaying U.S. warnings about a looming attack out of fear Ukrainians would flee the country in mass. If we had communicated that, then I would have been losing $7 billion a month since last October, he said. Alensky claimed that this deception of his own people prevented Russia from capturing the country in three days. Okay. <laughs> All right, Alensky, quote, he didn't want to put the country on a military footing because he was afraid of losing power. Journalist Bogdan Butkovich wrote on social media as cited by the Washington Post. Well, the whole article is all about how Alensky really messed up. Remove the, uh, the blame from Biden and throw it on Alensky. The Washington Post, the Jeff, Jeff Bezos owned and operated deep state controlled Washington Post is uh, they're starting to prepare to prepare the way for uh, throwing all the blame of the the military operation in Ukraine on uh, onto Alensky. They're going to throw Alensky on uh, under the bus. That is what's that is what is happening. It's going to take a couple of weeks, might even take a month, but that's what's going to happen. Remove the blame from Biden. Throw it onto Alensky. You were clueless, Zelensky. We warned you. You had no idea what you were doing. You're just a dumb actor. You're, uh, you're a white powder sniffing clown puppet actor. And uh, we tried to tell you to prepare for the Russian invasion. We gave you everything you needed to prepare for it. 
and you completely messed up and now you're shuffling around your generals and your commanders and you're purging your intelligence uh, heads and your intelligence agencies and you're in complete chaos everything's out of control and you don't have a handle on things and goodbye <laughs> something like that something like that is going to happen so let's do our clown worlds uh two clown worlds the first clown world is very very short brian stelter is gone from cnn he ran reliable sources uh the show that supposedly exposed fake news and everything that they do is exactly everything that they accuse other people of doing is exactly what they're doing so reliable sources was anything but reliable exposing fake news was, was anything but exposing fake news but boy oh boy brian uh brian stelter <laughs> you want to talk about clown puppets well he was the original clown puppet before um Elensky. and so i can't wait for mark dice and his video with regards to uh little brian stelter and how he's going to roast brian stelter because mark dice has the best brian stelter voice and i just can't wait for his video on this clown world uh topic so i'm just gonna leave it to mark dice He's going to do the best clown world with regards to Brian Stelter being fired from CNN. Let's talk about perhaps one of the biggest clown worlds ever, and it has to do with the Finnish Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, and this video, her party video, which has gone uber mega viral. And uh, search for the video. I'll put a little... Uh, I'll, I'll put a, uh, a short segment of that video on screen right now so you can see it without the music for copyright reasons. So that is the uh, the prime minister, 36 years old, uh, Santa Marin. She uh, She's no stranger to partying during the, uh, the lockdowns in Finland. She had a little controversy because she was partying with her husband. She went out to some sort of party or nightclub or a restaurant bar with some friends when... She had all of these lockdown things. Pretty common stuff that we saw from the elites. She's uh, She comes from the Klaus Schwab, W-E-E-F, uh, elite young leader school. That is one loud motorcycle. Um, so she's part of that whole graduating class of uh, Jacinda Ardern and Justin Trudeau and Macron and all of these guys. I don't know if they all graduated at the same time or they all went to the... To the klaus schwab indoctrination camp at the same time but anyway she's also from that that school i don't know if she exactly was a student of that school or if she just attended a bunch of conferences but she's part of that whole clique and um she always posts photos of herself you know wearing certain clothes and modeling clothes and partying and and just kind of being a cool kid you know that's kind of the image that she wants to cultivate the young cool kid and it works. There are a lot of people who say, oh, she's young and she's cool. She's like us. She's Gen X or Gen Z or Gen whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, you know. She's, uh, she's, like, she's like one of us. And that's, that's kind of the image that she wants to cultivate. Well, at the end of the day, I think she's just another Trudeau, Arden, Klaus Schwab, puppet crony. That's how I see her. Uh, but anyway, she... Uh, she put out a video where a video was leaked of her partying it up with her friends. I guess this was at some friend's house, boozing and, and just drinking and just having a good time. She says she didn't do any drugs or anything like that. She wasn't snorting the, the white stuff that Alensky uh, is famous for doing. But uh, now you can see why all of these, these Klaus Schwab elites get along with Alensky so well. You can see the, the, the connection, can't you? But... <laughs> She said, no, I didn't do any drugs. She said, I'm, I'm, I have nothing to be ashamed of. I, I wanted to party. I'm young. I wanted to hang out with my friends. I like to dance. And I wanted to party. And I have nothing to be ashamed of or apologize for. That's fine. Um, I don't have a problem with her going out and partying. You know, she's 36. She wants to go out, hang out with her friends. She wants to drink. That's fine. I don't understand why they have to film it and and uh and stuff like that i mean if you're gonna film it then i don't know maybe tell everybody to erase it afterwards i mean you know that you're a famous person why would you allow people to film it and then have it uh have them have a copy on their phone that strikes me as just kind of bad bad judgment 
I also believe that if you are the prime minister of a country, you know, you kind of, you kind of have to think that maybe one of these people at this party may actually leak this, or this might get out, and this may, this may make me look bad. So you would kind of expect a prime minister or a president to understand that and perhaps say, all right, everybody, that was a nice video. That was funny. That was fun. Can we erase it? Because, you know, I am prime minister of Finland and I would not like this to get out. I would imagine that everyone at the party would kind of understand that if you said something like that. But I don't know why she, she, uh, she didn't say that. But uh, she said, here's her quote. She says, I'm going to be exactly the same person as I, have, as I have been until now, and I hope that it will be accepted. So it's all about acceptance. She said, uh, according to the BBC, she said, I have a family life, I have a work life, and I have free time to spend with my friends. Pretty much the same as people my age. Um, Fox News says that supporters boast Marine's frequent partying with celebrities brings youth and a sense of cool to the office, while detractors claim the public exposure and lack of professionalism is unbecoming for a world leader. Now, she should have realized that a video like this, if it got out, would be used by the opposition. Absolutely. So once again, she may have probably uh, would have wanted to say to all her friends and buddies as they were boozing it up and dancing and doing these dance videos and all these things, kind of tell her friends, Okay, now let's erase the video. It was fun. Now let's all erase it because everybody understands. As far as her statement where she says, I'm going to be exactly the same person as I have been until now, and I hope that it will be accepted. You know, if you're going to be the prime minister of a country, yes, be yourself. Um, show parts of your personal life to the people. I have no problem with that. But on the flip side, if you're going to be prime minister, it comes with a certain sacrifice, you know, and that sacrifice is I have to I have to avoid doing some of the things that I used to do when I was not prime minister and I was not holding public office. I think that's common sense. And one of those things means that if I am going to be drinking and dancing at my friend's home, I can't have a video of me leaked out to the press or on social media. Or if if you guys at the party, if you guys want to do a dance video and put it on TikTok or whatever, that's fine, but I'm going to have to sit this one out. You understand, right, everybody? Yeah, we understand. Sana, no problem. Something like that would have been more, more intelligent. But she couldn't resist. She had to be in the video. The fact that she's 36 and doing these type of TikTok-esque videos you know, if, if she was 25, I would understand it. But I think if you're over 30 and, you know, you're holding public office, I don't know. <laughs> I think when you're 30 plus, you, got, you kind of have to put that stuff, you know, in the, in the past, I guess. But uh, anyway, um, you know, I have a friend who's a, a pediatric dentist. He's a dentist for children. And he lives in the U.S. And he tells me, like, when, when we would go out... And uh, say, you know, you're going out for dinner and everyone orders like, like wine or a beer or something like that. He would always not want to take photos. And the reason he never wanted to take photos, he told me, is because, look, these photos are going to get on Facebook. Someone's going to, uh, what is it, tag my face. This may be seen by customers and parents. And the parents may say, I don't want to take them to Dr. X because he's in a photo and he's drinking and he's partying or he's having dinner and he's drinking alcohol. And, uh, you know, it may turn me off from actually taking my, my kids to see him. I mean, it's kind of extreme on the one end, but on the other side, I understand it. You're marketing yourself. You have a certain reputation. You're dealing with children. You know, you may want to, you know, not have alcohol in any of the, the posts about you on social media. You see, that's, that's responsible thinking. Is it a little extreme? Maybe. But it is responsible thinking. And it's saying, you know what, better to, 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 to be more extreme than have something reckless come out or have something that could be marketed against me, given the line of work that I do. And it also shows maturity and sacrifice in that... You know, yeah, sure, I would love to be in this photo with everybody, you know, holding a beer and toasting, saying, and, you know, 
doing stuff like that. But my job and my business means that it's best that I don't do this. And so, you know, I mean, you know, you're a doctor and you're dealing with children. I understand that. That I can see. So my take on all of this is I understand her desire to want to be in this in this video. And I think this is the longest clown world I've ever done. <laughs> I understand her desire to be in this video. I get it. But uh, she should have exercised, in my opinion, she should have exercised a little bit more uh, caution. And given the times that we live in, the fact that Finland is is ramping up war rhetoric with Russia, the fact that we have hyperinflation and energy crisis and economic crisis, the fact that Finland is uh, is now about to uh, to cut off all Russian tourists and they're acting in a very racist, discriminatory, bigoted way. Uh, the fact that all this is happening and that Finland is such a, has attracted so much attention in the last week or two, and the fact that Finland wants to join NATO and it's going to become a NATO state, and that means uh, possible... Uh, conflict with Russia, you never know, you would expect your prime minister to be more sober during these times. The fact that people are hurting uh, on an economic level, the fact that businesses are going to close or are closing down, you would expect your prime minister to exercise better judgment and be more sober and, uh, and professional. I understand that she wants to do this stuff. I understand how she wants to market herself as hip and cool. I get all of that. And I understand the fact that she's 36 and she wants to hang out with her friends and party with her friends and get wasted with her friends. That's fine. But my opinion on this, and I could be wrong, is that you're the prime minister of a country and you have to accept certain sacrifices and you have to accept a certain public image. And if that public image cramps your style a bit and it means that you can't party on camera, you may be able to, to party off camera. But if it means you can't party on camera, well, then so be it. The interesting part about this, a final thought, is not that she was partying at a party or at a public event, because we've seen many world leaders dancing. Obama, Boris Johnson, uh, Trudeau a dozen times. We've seen all kinds of leaders dancing and partying it up at public events, and we've laughed and we've made fun of them. But this was interesting because it was a video leaked during a private event, during a friend get together. So it gave us a glimpse as to how the elite Davos, you know, World Economic Forum kids spend their free time, which is pretty much boozing, boozing up and, uh, and acting like a bunch of idiots, like the rest of us. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave it there. That's the video, guys. Uh, the Duran.locals.com. Um, Check out Alexandra's channel. Check out the, the Durant's channel. Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. And that is it. Take care.